We can go ahead and have a seat. It's good to be with you tonight. Uh, my name is Robert. I'm one of the pastors here. And I invite you to turn to the book of Luke. If you've been hanging out with us for a little while, uh, you knew that was coming. Uh, but instead of turning to chapter 18 or chapter 19, I'm going to encourage you to actually to turn to chapter 1 uh, because we've been in Luke all of 2022, but we skipped the first couple chapters because they contain the story of Jesus coming, his birth. And so we kind of saved it for last. So as we we uh, wind down the last few weeks here of the book of Luke. We're going to end in the beginning as we look at the Christmas story because it is, in fact, uh, the season of Christmas. Decorations are up. Uh, Christmas songs are being played. Gifts are being purchased. Plans are being made. It is officially Christmas now. And, and as always, uh, our hope for you is that in the midst of the, the season of Christmas that you would remember why we do the things that we do this time of year. It's not just because the, the calendar says that Christmas is approaching that we do these things, but it's because the birth of a Savior is approaching, that we, we prepare, we celebrate, we, uh, we get excited for this time of year. And, and I, as I watch our world kind of uh, always fall into the chaos of the Christmas season, I think of uh, the Charlie Brown Christmas special, if you can remember watching that on TV as a kid. And I remember there's this, this kind of pivotal moment in the show where Charlie Brown is, is kind of fed up with all the production and chaos of Christmas, and he shouts out, isn't there anyone who can tell me what Christmas is all about? And Linus steps up to the mic and he calls for attention and he quotes Luke chapter 2 about the coming of Jesus and the announcement of Jesus to the shepherds. And then he turns and says, that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. And it is, in fact, what Christmas is all about. It is about the coming of Jesus. It's about a Savior who was born for us. It's about a world that was changed because of a baby being born. But sometimes I wonder if we, if we look at the Christmas story and, and maybe get a little disconnected from it. You're like, man, this was, this was 2,000 years ago. This is in a, a different continent. This is in a different world, essentially, than we live in. Or maybe you're like, man, I've heard this before. I've heard this my entire life, starting with the Charlie Brown Christmas special. And so what I want to do is, as we look at Luke chapter 1, we're going to look at the announcement of Jesus coming. But before we jump into that, I want to say, hey, how are we similar or different than the time that Mary and Joseph and the people of that day were living in? Because again, we can feel like we're, we're separated by such a vast difference of worlds, but maybe that's not the case. Because as we look at Luke chapter one, we find the world in a place that is, is stressed and, and worried about a government situation. See, the, the people of Israel in that day, they had their leadership, but they also had the Roman leadership who had come in and, and kind of taken over dominion there. So there's this, this conflict between the two leadership, but there's also this, this tension that the Roman government was oppressive and aggressive in how they led and what they demanded of the people, which led to an economic issue. See, the, the world in that day wasn't exactly wealthy, but now there was this system of government that created an even bigger problem because they were being double taxed. They were still having to pay the temple tax for Israel, but also having to pay a tax to Caesar, which led to an incredible amount of, of poverty and hunger and debt, which also led to another issue they were facing of division. They had uh, these two very different directions of, 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 of push in terms of how the country was being led and, and what messaging was being put out. And one scholar says that if you were living in that day, you had to face a choice, basically between going in collusion with this corrupt Roman government or living in poverty, and the two did not respect one another. Even within the church, there was division. Within the, the religious community, the, the, the temple leadership or their church in that day, there was, there was a division and conflict. Because you had these two main uh, leadership groups within the religious community, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who were always in conflict based on the philosophy of how things should be lived out. The Sadducees were a little bit more progressive. They were encouraging the, the importation of, of some of the Greek culture of that day where the Pharisees were saying, no, we've got to stand on the foundations of history. So they had government issues. They had economy issues. They had division issues. And maybe their world isn't all that different than ours is. 
Maybe the world that we look at when we look at the, the, the coming of our Savior Jesus isn't all that different than where we find ourselves today. So with that in mind, let's look at Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26, and let's see uh, what we can learn from the announcements of Jesus coming. So down in verse 26, it says this in Luke chapter 1. It says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. He came and said to her, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. Behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age also conceived a son. This is the sixth month with her who has been called barren, for nothing is impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So I think that as we look at this announcement that's being made to Mary about the coming of Jesus we see two really big things that, that are really relevant to our life today. And the first is that God interrupts our world with good news. There's this massive interruption that comes for Mary. She's got her plans for her life, her marriage, her family, everything that she is thinking and planning about gets this massive interruption at the, the announcement of this angel to her. Whatever she was thinking for her future, for what motherhood would look like, what her family would look like, what her plans would look like, are drastically changed in this moment. Essentially, everything is thrown out the world with this interruption from the angel here. But also we see that, that whatever she had planned gets this massive upgrade as well, because she gets to become part of God's plan for salvation to the world. As a Jewish girl, she would have grown up hearing about the coming of the Messiah and this prophecy about God's Savior who would be coming into the world. And now she gets to be a part of this story. She gets to play a part in the, the biggest, most life-changing event that had ever happened in history. And, and, and think about the, the family legacy side of that for her. I don't know if, if they thought about this in the first century the way we do, about wanting to leave a legacy and have an impact but if they did, think about Mary and Joseph, the conversations maybe they had about wanting to make a, an impact in Nazareth and their kind of a town and area there. And it gets this massive upgrade of now the entire world knows about their story, knows about the role they played in, in the story of salvation. And it's all because Jesus came into the world and interrupted everything. So he interrupted Mary and Joseph's plans, but he also interrupted everything else that was going on in that day. We see that about 30 years later, Jesus would start his ministry. He would start traveling and teaching and preaching and performing miracles and doing amazing things, and the world noticed. As you read through Scripture, it said that, that massive crowds would gather. If they found out where Jesus was at, they would come from miles away to find him. If they had social media and TV and news like we do today, it would have been Jesus on the, the news, on the headlines every single day. He interrupted everything. It changed the, the events of that day, but he also interrupted the, the religious communities as well. See, he came in and all of a sudden he started pushing back against some of their customs, some of the things that they said people had to do, and even bigger, he started talking about a new covenant and the word covenant was a big deal to them because they had studied the Old Testament and, and they had seen that God had these series of progressive covenants or agreements that he made with his people that basically said, here's what I promise to do to you if you promise to be faithful. And, and it would include a series of blessings or curses if you followed or ignored this covenant. And the religious leaders, everything they did was to teach people about these covenants and then Jesus comes and he says, I'm starting a new covenant. It's like, well, 
but what about the old ones? What about these other ones that we've been following for years and, and this is the center of everything we believe about following God? And he says, I have a new one. It gets interrupted. But it's a, a new covenant where all people can find grace and reconciliation to God, not just the Jewish people. It's a new covenant where there's no longer a need for animal sacrifices in a temple on a regular basis because Jesus was the sacrifice for all. It's a new covenant full of hope, full of promise, full of of life and purpose for us. And so Jesus interrupted. He interrupted Mary and Joseph and their plans. He interrupted the world and the religious communities and everything in that day. And he interrupted it with the best news that has ever been shared. And maybe you need that today as well. Maybe life has interrupted you with some bad news. Maybe there's been a death or a diagnosis, maybe a job loss or a divorce or some other bad news that you're wondering, man, how, how do we move forward through this? Maybe your life is full of conflict and stress. Maybe there's disagreements. Maybe there's a change of plans. Maybe something has blown up and you don't know what it looks like to move forward. Or maybe you're just here wondering where you have hope. Where do we find hope in a world that doesn't promote hope, who doesn't point us to where to find it, but instead looks at all the reasons to be hopeless. If that's you today, I hope that you would find and see the hope that comes in Jesus. That you would see that Jesus brings the best news ever. You would see that he is good, that he loves and cares for you, and that he wants to bring you good news of great joy. Good news uh, of peace, and reconciliation, of love and transformation, of hope in a hopeless world. Because God interrupted our world 2,000 years ago with the best news that has ever happened. And it transformed everything, and the reason for that is that the good news of Jesus is unique. See, that's the second thing I think we see from the story is as Gabriel comes to Mary and brings this proclamation of good news, he, he makes it very clear that Jesus was not just any other boy being born in Nazareth that day, but he was unique. And we see him kind of describe three different categories of just how special and unique Jesus would be and how he was showing Mary that he would indeed be the son of God and not just another boy that was born. And we see this in a couple of ways. First, it starts with the, the, the conception. There's a virgin conception and birth. And, and this has always been a, a tension point for all of history and even a tension point for Mary here. She goes, how can this be? She's, she's old enough and, and wise enough to understand how you get pregnant. She's like, uh, how is this gonna happen? And yet that was God's plan. God's plan for all of history for, was for it to occur this way. And there's, I think, some, some reasons for this that we can glean from it. First, it shows that, that God initiated this. So this wasn't something that just happened, but it was intentionally planned by God. It also shows how God uh, created this plan and how he made it to be that Jesus would be both fully man, born of a woman, fully human in his form, but also fully divine, fully holy, and fully the son of God. Neither one of those things being compromised. And with that, it helps us understand the, the connection and how Jesus would relate to the sin that every one of us experiences. See, in Hebrews chapter four, verse 15, it says that Jesus was human and was tempted in every single way as we are, yet he did not sin. And in chapter seven, it says that he was innocent, unstained, and separated from sinners. Yet we see that the Bible teaches that all of us as humans inherit a, a sin nature from Adam, the very first human. Go back to Genesis chapter three, we see that Adam and Eve sin and create this, this lineage of sin tendency where we don't have to learn sin, we don't have to figure out what it is and step into it, it's ingrained in us from birth. And yet that's not the case with Jesus. He's innocent, spotless, separated from sinners because he came into this world in a way that no other person in all of history has. So the angel proclaims that, that this coming boy was unique in the Son of God because of the virgin conception and birth, but also because of the Davidic line. 
It says that, he, that this boy that was coming to be named Jesus would inherit the throne of his father David. And you're like, I thought Mary was engaged to Joseph. Who's the David guy? Oh, well, he's King David, one of the, the main kings in the history of Israel who ruled about a thousand years before this took place. And David became this, this significant person in the history of Israel, and it was significant because they were told that the Savior, the Messiah, would come through the family line of David. So as, as she hears that he would inherit the throne of his father David, she's thinking of the prophecies. These prophecies from Isaiah and Ezekiel and 2 Samuel and Jeremiah that talk about the coming of the Savior through the line of David. And this is such a big deal that in a couple chapters, Luke will actually trace every generation from Jesus back to David. The book of Matthew does this as well because this was significant because it showed that Jesus fulfilled prophecy things that were foretold, things that were predicted, and then later came true in the life of Jesus, which is the third thing we see about how Jesus was unique. There's all these these prophecies, not just about his family heritage, but so much more. See, Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14 says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. See, the fact that he would be born of a virgin was a prophecy that was fulfilled. The place he was born was also a prophecy. Micah chapter five, verse two says, but you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me the one who will be the ruler over Israel. Now what's interesting about this is Mary and Joseph didn't live in Bethlehem. We we know from the story that they traveled in, but This is significant. There's this prophecy that a savior would be born in Bethlehem and yet Mary and Joseph live 100 miles north of Bethlehem in a town called Nazareth. Now, we can drive 100 miles really easily, but when we're traveling by foot or by donkey or camel or horseback, it's a little bit more significant. And yet, at just the right time, the Roman government issued a decree that everyone should be taken a part of a census probably so they could figure out how much to tax them, but they had to travel back to their their city of origin. And for for Joseph, that was Bethlehem. And as we know from the next chapter of Luke, while they were there, the time came for Mary to give birth, thus fulfilling this prophecy. Even little things like Numbers chapter 24 talks about how a star would arise over the place of Jesus, the Messiah's birth. And that night, a star rose, and the the wise men, the magi, come traveling because of the star that they saw. So even the decorations and how we use stars to, to celebrate Christmas are a reminder of a prophecy fulfilled in Jesus. We could continue on, but there's over 300 prophecies that have been directly fulfilled in the life of Jesus, from his birth to his death and resurrection. Everything fulfills these prophecies. And see, this is important because uh, scholars and people of all different walks of life will say, yeah, I believe that Jesus was real. I believe that he lived, but I think he was just a guy. I think he was just a teacher or religious leader, or maybe he was just this good, you know, philanthropist and, and this good example for everybody. But we've had plenty of those people who have lived and didn't have 300 plus prophecies fulfilled about their life. I don't know about you, but I don't have any prophecies predicting where and when and how I would be born dating from 500 years and older. Heck, the pilgrims hadn't even landed here 500 years ago for them to predict where you or I would be born. And yet that's the case for Jesus. And and I share this because we have to look at some of these things and answer the question, what will I believe about who Jesus is? Will we believe that he is just a guy, just a teacher, just a a leader, just a role model from history? Or will we believe that he is unlike any other person who's ever walked this earth? That he is the son of God and savior of the world, that he is unique and special and someone that we need to pay attention to. He needs to shape our understanding of who Jesus is. And today I hope that you would do that. I hope that you would see Jesus not just as a good teacher, a religious leader, a philanthropist, that you would see him as the son of God and savior of the world. 
I hope that you would see him as someone who changes your life in the process of that. And I guess what I'm asking is, will you trust in Jesus? Will you trust in who Jesus is, what the message of Jesus proclaims for our life and the impact that has for our world? See, as you look back at, at Mary's response, she says, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. She hears this news that is literally life-changing for her and her whole family. She doesn't argue, she doesn't negotiate, she doesn't nitpick parts of the plan, she just submits and trusts in what was declared. So today, will you trust in Jesus? You're not gonna be asked to, to carry and deliver the Son of God and Savior of the world, but you're going to be put in situations where you have to answer that question, will I trust in Jesus for this situation? So three questions with that. Will you trust in Jesus for your eternity? And this seems like a basic question. If you've been around church for a while, you're like, of course I do, but, but I want you to think through that. Do you actually believe that Jesus is the Son of God and Savior of the world? Do you believe he was born of a virgin, lived a perfect and sinless life, do you believe that he died on a cross to pay for your sins and rose three days later? And do you then look at that and say, my life is going to be different because I'm going to follow him forever? If you haven't done that, we'll have a, a prayer team down here across the front of the stage after service. I'd love to talk with you, pray with you. If you're ready to say, hey, I want to follow Jesus. Or, or we'd love, if you need a conversation, you wanna dive into that, connect with myself or one of the other pastors, we'd love to share more about that so that you can get to the place of trusting in Jesus for your eternity, knowing that he brings grace and forgiveness and reconciliation to our Savior when we do that. But if you have done that, I want you to realize that that's the biggest decision you can make with your life. You've, you've checked the box of saying, I trust you with the most significant thing in my life, so thus trusting in him in, in the smaller areas should be simpler. But do you trust him for your eternity? Secondly, do you trust him in the unknowns? Do you trust in Jesus for the unknowns of life? You look at, at Mary and the, the, the laundry list of unknowns that this announcement brought, and yet she stepped forward in trust. And today, you may have a list of unknowns as well. You may be struggling with health or family or work or finances or relationships and full of uncertainties and unknowns and not knowing what next looks like. But will you trust that God is with you? Will you trust that Jesus is good, that he is redeeming and working in your life? Will you trust that he's going to guide you and help you in every step of the way? Will you trust him in the unknowns? See, in scripture we see all kinds of promises that God is with us, that God is good and wants to help us. And we see one in particular in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper, not to harm you. Plans to bring you future and a hope. And we look at that and, and we can get all the nice, warm, fuzzy vibes from that and think, man, this is so encouraging. And I've seen that on graduation cards and, 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 and coffee mugs and notebooks and all sorts of things. But I think we miss the, the context, the situation that, that was delivered in. See, as that's being delivered to the people of Israel around 590 BC, they were in the midst of being taken out of Israel into Babylon as captives. Their world was completely turned upside down. They were not at home anymore. They were in an enemy's territory. This is like us waking up one day and our world's been invaded, our nation's been invaded by you know, China or Russia or North Korea and we are living in one of those countries now. And, and we don't know if we'll ever go back home, we don't know if we're going to live, we don't know how we're going to find food and provision, we don't know how to connect with our family or our friends and the message from God says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper, not to harm you, plans to bring you a future and a hope has a little different connotation to it, thinking about the context. They're asked to trust that God was with them and had plans and had their best interest at heart, even in the midst of massive uncertainty and unknowns. So today, will you trust God in the unknowns? Lastly, will you trust God for our world? 
See, you may have concerns apart from your personal life. You may have concerns about the world at large, about the economy and politics and foreign affairs and, and, and all the things that are happening about morality and the state of the church and all these things. And I hear it so often. I hear people lament about the, the decline of our country and, oh, you know, we're on this slippery slope of morality and everything's going downhill and, and we're just not a Christian nation anymore. And usually people say that with these, the, these kind of connotations of stress and worry and anxiety about how dire our situation is. And that might be true. The situation in our world, especially in our country, it may be dire. And I certainly see the decline of our country, but we have to ask that same question, will we trust Jesus in the midst of that? Will we trust that that Jesus is still good, that he is still with us, that he is still working to accomplish his purposes. And part of that trust needs to be understanding that, that God's purpose for our world is not the building up and making known the great name of America among the nations. The purpose of God in our world is to make his name known and his name great among the nations. And for some of us, that's a, that's a tension point because we want to see America prosper sometimes above anything else, but that's not God's plan for our world. God's plan is to see us draw closer to Jesus and then share the good news and the good hope of Jesus unto the nations and see the name of Jesus become known everywhere. Now, I don't know if that means that that he doesn't necessarily care about how countries work and how systems are structured, but I know that his top priority isn't America and its health, and maybe it shouldn't be our top priority either. Maybe our top priority shouldn't be stressing about the future of our country, but worrying about how we can serve and glorify Jesus in every situation that we find ourselves in, knowing that that is exactly God's desire and hope for our life. So will we trust Jesus for our world? Will we trust him in the unknowns? Will we trust him for our eternity? Because he wants to interrupt our life with the best news that has ever come, and that is the birth of a Savior who loves us, who wants to reconcile us back to God. So today, will you trust in that good news? Will you see it as life-changing, and will you submit to following Jesus for the rest of your life? because he wants to interrupt our world with the best news that has ever happened. And it's up to us if we want to trust in it and follow that good news. It's our prayer that as we look at our world, we would see the interruption of Jesus as the best thing ever and have our life changed for it. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. Thank you for just the the timeless news of Jesus whether this is the first time or the 50th or the 70th time, however many times we've heard it, God, I thank you that it never gets old. I thank you that, that you stepped into our world knowing that there was nothing we could do to draw close to you. There's nothing we could do to save ourselves, to earn heaven, to earn our eternal destination. So you stepped in and did what only you could do. God, I pray that this Christmas season we wouldn't get caught up in the events and the the happenings and the, the things going on, but that we would remember who you are and that everything is about you and how you want to change our life through the news of the coming of Jesus. So help us today to live in that, to trust in you, and follow you with our life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.